Hello, critics, non-critics, and friends. Welcome to the Film Optics Podcast, where we take a glance into blockbusters, indie films, and everything in between. I'm your host, Christian, and I'm joined by friend of the show, Nicole Ackman from Next Best Picture. And today, we're going to be reviewing a non-spoiler episode of Downton Abbey, A New Era, the second focus feature Downton Abbey film to hit theaters again this is spoiler free so worry not 100 we're not going to give anything away about the movie i know a lot of people haven't seen this since i mean we're technically recording this prior to the movie actually hitting theaters but we were both fortunate enough to see it beforehand so we kind of want to give you guys our thoughts on the film as a whole and before we begin today's episode you can listen to our podcast on podcast platforms around the internet. That includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. And if you are a new or seasoned listener to the show, we would love to hear from you guys. Follow us on Instagram and follow us on Twitter at Film Optics. That is Optics with an X. Or you can email us at FilmOptics at gmail.com for any movie-related questions. Lady Nicole, how are you doing today? I am so excited to talk about this movie. I felt like I watched it forever ago because I had an early screening and I've been so desperate to talk to someone about it um, because I love Downton Abbey so much and I'm so excited to be here to, to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan myself. Period pieces always just, they, they you know, they bring something out of me. They speak to me in some kind of way. And I don't know what it is, but... I started watching Downton Abbey, the, the show, I think it was like oh, maybe 2017, 2018. Um, this one girl who I just like randomly went on a date, just like mentioned it. She's like, oh, you would like this show. And I was like, OK, so I started watching it. I haven't heard from her since, but I started watching it. So it was probably one of the best like conversations or like things to ever happen to me in my life. I'm like, hey, you know, this this random person I went on a date with just said, hey, you love Downton Abbey. I was like. All right, I'll check it out. And I just fell in love with the series ever since. And, you know, the first movie came out, blew my socks away. And, you know, it felt like the it just, it felt like they never skipped a beat. And I feel like they're doing the same thing with a, a new era. Um, a few differences here and there. But, you know, it is all about bringing Downton into the modern age, essentially. You know, there there's a lot of, going, you know, a lot of mustache twirly, you know, scandals going on uh, with, <laughs> within, uh, you know, uh, France and within the uh, <laughs> Downton Manor as well. Uh, again, for everyone out there, this is going to be a non-spoiler review for everybody. So are you ready, Nicole, to dive in to our analysis of Downton Abbey, A New Era? I am so ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back after this introduction to Downton Abbey, A New Era. Have you told them, Lady Grantham? She's told us nothing. Do sit down. I've come into possession of a villa in the south of France. What villa? Start at the beginning. Years ago, before you were born, I met a man. They spend a few days together and he gives her a house. You never thought to turn it down? Do I look as if I'd turn down a villa in the south of France? All right, ladies and gentlemen, and we are back with our Downton Abbey, A New Era review. Again, spoiler free. I just want to keep hammering it home until it gets <laughs> in everybody's brains. Um, this film is directed by Simon Curtis and written by Julian Fellows and stars Hugh Bonview, Jim Carter, Michelle Dockery, and the entire returning cast. And the story is as follows. Uh, this is a follow-up to the 2019 feature film, which the Crawley family and the Downton staff receive a royal... Wait, oh my God, okay. This is the 10th time that this has happened. Or I guess this is more the follow-up for it. I'm sorry, I'm overthinking it here. So this is a follow-up <laughs> to the 2019 feature film where the royal family came to visit uh, the king and queen. And now... Within uh, Downton Abbey, a new era, it's all about uh, moving pictures and talkies and just this entire scandal between, you know, um, <laughs> Mr. Crawley's uh, mother uh, and this whole, you know, villa situation. 
So I'm actually going to pass it over to Nicole so she can give her initial reactions to Downton Abbey, A New Era. I was so curious going into this movie because I wasn't sure if they were going to be able to sort of recapture that Downton Abbey magic again. I felt like the first film was a really good sort of continuation of the series, but I actually think this movie is an even better follow-up to the series and that it feels more like the actual series to me because I think the first film was very like frothy and light and this one feels like it has a lot more of the actual like emotional depth that the series did while still being super fun to watch. I think having you know, all these new exciting things happen, like at Downton is really fun, but also getting this new setting in France is super fun as well. And I think there's something very meta about this whole idea of we're seeing a movie get filmed at Downton Abbey when we know that for years now, Downton Abbey has been filmed at Highclere Castle. And I think that that is something really interesting. It's something that obviously a lot of estates in this time period actually were going through was deciding to be opened up um, you know, two film studios to use to shoot on location. And it brought with it a whole new set of questions about, you know, allowing access to the upper class estates in this way. And I'm just fascinated by it. I love to see characters returning. And also all of my favorite characters got really good plot lines in this movie. So I could not be more thrilled. (laughs) (laughs) I do agree with you uh, there, Nicole, Uh, when it comes to this film at first, I was really afraid that it wasn't going to feel like a continuation, you know, it's going to be more of a cash grab, like, Oh, you know, the first film did so well. And then, you know, we're just going to, keep going with it. And, but it really does. um, It really does continue the story in, in a beautiful way. You know, if, if you've seen the series, like I feel like you're going to be so lost if you, if you haven't seen the series (laughs) at all, like, I mean, you could watch the first two movies and that's amazing, but it's like, they really are continuations of, um, you know, of the series itself. And I believe it ran for six seasons and it felt just, I mean, I just love going back, you know, this, to this time period and seeing how, you know, Downton adjusts to this new modern world with every, you know, step at a time, uh, you know, the King and Queen coming to Downton for the first one was a bit of a, you know, it, it felt like a natural progression, but now it's like, Hey, you know, we're, we're getting into, you know, movies about a movie and <laughs> which is <laughs> Something I never thought that was going to happen uh, with this um, with this film. And you see a lot of beginnings, you know, like the set direction, you know, directors and, you know, the production design and how movies were, you know, edited essentially back then. And just how precise everything needed to be in order to make even just silent films um, in a way. But, you know, once they started adding, you know, real audio and dialogue, it, you know, changes the game. And we see a lot of um, producer interference or studio interference within this movie, um, within the movie about the movie within this film, uh, which is really just, it's still relevant today. (laughs) Yep. I will say, I think this movie is so fun for anyone who is a fan of early film and sort of that period where they were, you know, transitioning from silent film to talkies, because just getting to see, you know, the equipment and the way that they're doing all the like film sets and everything, I found so fascinating because it is a time period that we don't have like behind the scenes footage a lot for Mm -hmm. so it was really fun to see them recreating that it definitely was and it's i mean like you said there's so many storylines that kind of just you know weave in and out it it really feels like you know the a plot and then there's a b plot um in a way but you know there's plots within plots so it's (laughs) it's all um (laughs) it's very interesting i will say from the newest cast members um the, oh, I I think her name was uh, the star of yeah. the actual, I'm bl- drawing a blank. I'm looking up on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, Laura Haddock. Laura Haddock. As, um, as, as Myrna. Myrna, that's right. She, she probably had to be one of my favorite characters. I mean, of course, Mary is always top notch for me, like 100%. Okay. <laughs> Um, but yeah, for, for the new character, I thought she, I thought she did a great job. It really shows in her position of, you know, the films that she used to make versus 
you know, when they started moving into talkies and it's like, she kind of has to make this decision or adapt to this new world of film. Um, even with, there's a lot of voiceover aspects as well, which is, what's really cool to see. I will say it definitely feels like a playoff of the character of Lena Lamont in singing in the rain, which I thought was so fun. And that is like a very real thing that happened to a lot of actresses in that era was they weren't sure if they were going to have a career anymore Mm. once, you know, people started talking in film. So I thought that was super fun. And that, that is a really like fun new character. And I also think a type of character that we've never had before on Downton Abbey. So it was definitely something a bit different. Definitely. And of course, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, I guess, uh, not only with the mysterious past of, you know, Robert's mother, but Robert <laughs> within himself. So there, there's a lot of questions there that kind of, you know, get tossed around and, um, you know, raises a lot of suspicion, I guess you could say, <laughs> within this. Yep. But um, I kind of wanted to pass over to you, uh, kind of talk about the storylines, or I guess which character would you say had the best storyline or which one was your favorite? Obviously without, you know, we're, we're talking about a movie without talking yeah. about, <laughs> which is kind of hard, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. I will say, I don't think this is like a huge spoiler, um, but Edith in it is a character that I find super fascinating because I think that over the course of the whole series, she is the person who has changed the most. And I think that it's really nice that we get to sort of see her, once again, coming into herself and we get to see that Edith is this mother and wife, but also a career woman. And she really, I feel like, embodies this whole idea of modernity coming to Downton. So that was quite fun. I also, my favorite character of all time is Tom Branson. I love that man. (laughs) Sybil was my favorite character originally in Downton Abbey. I actually like rage quit the show after Sybil's death. And I didn't go back and watch the rest, like the whole thing until like 2018. Really? I was like, I was like, I'm out. I ain't doing this anymore. Yeah. I was like, I'm done. And I eventually went back to it. Cause my mother's a huge Downton Abbey fan. And she was like, no, no, you need to like come watch out. I was like, all right, I'm fine. And now of course I like, I do love it. And I, I've never quite forgiven them for it, but you know, I, I do love the series and it was really nice. I think for me to see that a lot of this film actually revolves around um, even though like she's not a main character, but it revolves around the character of Sibby, mm-hmm. Tom Branson and Sybil's daughter. And I think it's really nice to sort of see that they haven't forgotten about that character because I think that, that would have been really easy for Julian Fellows to do is sort of have her always just be sort of a forgotten, like, oh yeah, Sibby's here. Whereas they actually really thought about her and, and what her position would be amongst her cousins and and what that means for them. And I really appreciated that. It's also so nice to just see Tom Branson get to be happy. Yeah. Speaking of Tom's getting to be happy, Thomas Barrow is one of my other favorite characters. And he, I don't think anyone on Downton Abbey has gone through more than Thomas Barrow has. And uh, I, I really liked that he got, without giving anything away, but he got a really happy, fulfilling storyline finally finally i feel like i've been waiting for this for so many years (laughs) and i think anyone who is a a fan of thomas barrow is going to be so happy with what happens in the film it's so nice to see him really you know get to have that happiness that it Mm. feels like he's been chasing at this point for like i mean the series started in what 1912 yeah so this character's been chasing happiness for like 10 years at this point yeah it was like right after Um, the uh, titanic sink i believe yeah exactly yeah so it i was so excited with all three of those plot lines yeah it's 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 great that you know when you bring up uh tom um branson i i like you said i really like how they they still keep you know the the spirit of sybil within the entire um the these films and you kind of see that also with uh lady mary's um, you know, with her and Matt, I was I was very mad about Sybil's death, <laughs> but I was even more pissed. <laughs> I was like, okay, like Matt, he's just, Matthew Crawley. He just dri- <laughs> he's just driving, and I was like, okay, what? It, it just happened, like out of nowhere. I was like, wait, did did that what what? <laughs> I'm sitting there one day. I'm like, okay, like I think. Yeah. That just happens. And I'm like, so what happens now? And, but like, they've always seemed to 
essentially kind of like recover from the cast members that they have lost. And I think they've done, you know, a great job with the series um, onward. And of course with, with the two now with the two films, but I do agree with uh, Thomas Barrow's character. It was very, um, he, he, like you said, he's come a very, very long way. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of, he, he wasn't everyone's like, he, he was the character you love to hate in mm-hmm. a way, kind of like how King Joffrey was in Game of Thrones, but yeah. he was such a great character, but I really like how, you know, he, he finally, it's almost as if he's found peace within his own life and he's yeah. finally able to move forward without any, um, any hesitation. I also really appreciate the way that the series, particularly, you know, now with this film has handled the whole, you know, sort of concept of Thomas Barrow's sexuality and that it's very honest about the difficulties that a gay man in that time period in his position would be facing. But it also shows that I think it's, it's so nice to see that the people around Thomas uh, accept him for who he is. And they're, you know, even sort of, um, sort of like covertly encouraging of him in being who he is. And I think that's really nice that they've handled it in that way that feels, you know, it's not that they're being unrealistic, but it's also not, I feel like sometimes in period dramas, if there is a gay character, it's just there to be like, being gay really sucked in the 1800s. Like, you know, yeah, like just like, like a plot device. But of course, you know, with exactly. Mrs. Hughes has always been mm-hmm. very, supportive of yeah and even mary is sort of yeah you know without saying it is is support in in a very merry way (laughs) i love mary so i don't know what it is i'm like (laughs) when when the series first started i was like okay like obviously everybody loves sybil everybody loves him and then with lady edith she was kind of just like the butt of the joke sister and what you mentioned earlier you know within these two films especially within a new era we really get to see her shine and come within Mm -hmm. her own so it's like she is, you know, she's there. She's one of the main um, players. So it's like, yeah. but then like Lady Mary, I was like, man, I was like, I just, I don't know what it was. I'm like, she just, she just commands the room. I don't know what it was, yeah. but I was like, She's man. also got like, obviously everybody talks about that Maggie Smith's character, mm. the, you know, the Dowager Countess has all these like really good quippy lines and like, um, you know, all this like really nice wit and everything, which yeah. is true. But I think Mary also has a lot of that. Like that character also has so many good sarcastic little lines <laughs> and she delivers them all so well. Mm. I just, I love, you know, seeing her. And I think it's really nice to get to see her come into her own in this film in a way that uh, we've gotten to see Sybil do back in the earlier seasons. And we got to see Edith do. And now we're really getting to see Mary sort of get to make her own decisions about Downton and Mm -hmm. and about what's going to happen there. And I really like seeing, you know, the torch sort of get past. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, she, she really is uh, lady. Mary really is like manning the ship and, you know, Downton is essentially kind of um, falling apart physically within this movie. Yeah. And um, (laughs) I was like, Oh, I've never been to that location. And (laughs) And this yeah, is, right. We've never seen the attic. Like, I was like, yeah. wow, oh, I guess, you know, there's there's the basement life, you know, it's like, oh, let's yeah. what's going M- up on much the- like Robert, we've never been there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that was hilarious when he just uh I yeah. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but yeah, it, it really is nice that you know it's even though you know for the time period it's set in, you know, it is very much still like a you know white man's world but you know within this you know within this family they kind of acknowledge like you know um you know mr crawley had three daughters you know lost one but now it's you know lady mary's kind of just um taking charge of everything and you know she really is the future um of this house and as um you know, uh, Violet said in the previous film that, you know, like our descendants will live different lives from us. And you're yeah. kind of starting to see, you know, the setups, you know, the industrial age and mm-hmm. whatnot. So it really is just a fantastic movie. Um, I guess um, we can kind of talk about the the other, the, I guess the B plot line of this entire yeah. uh, film, you know, the, the mysterious past of Violet Crawley. <laughs> <laughs> You know, why would she give up a you know an entire villa in the south of France? I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. Yeah. I'm like, I've certainly never uh 
had anyone gift me a villa in the south of France. But if anyone's considering it, like by all means, go ahead. <laughs> I will take it. Exactly. Like, <laughs> I'll go there once a year, you know, birthdays, yeah, exactly. celebrations. Exactly. <laughs> Summer in, in the South of France sounds great. Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, it's, I was trying to think of if there was anything that didn't necessarily work for me, but the more I think about it, like, I need to see it again, you know, with mm-hmm. fans, of course, because yes. <laughs> there's only two of us in that screening. Um, yeah, <laughs> early, <laughs> I was so. alone in mine. I'm going opening night, though, because I'm like, I need to experience mm-hmm. this with a bunch of suburban moms. Oh, yeah. Probably are <laughs> all going to have a glass of wine. <laughs> like that is that's how I saw the first movie. It is the ideal way to experience it out in Abbey film. Like some wine drunk suburban moms is my ideal crowd. Like. <laughs> Yeah. I, I felt the same way when I watched um oh my gosh, it was the Ford v Ferrari movie. There was a lot it was an older crowd for sure. And you know, it's I was the youngest person in my screening of Ford v Ferrari. Was where I went, <laughs> and I went with my dad. Like mm. literally my dad was like, I want to see this movie. And I was like, All right, dad, we'll go see this movie. Yeah. And I was in there with a bunch of other dads. <laughs> <laughs> and they were living for I think there is something to be said it's kind of like you know you want to see a Marvel film mm. with a bunch of other Marvel fans when it opens there are certain films that they have their crowds and they are best experienced in their crowds yep. and Downton Abbey is one of them oh yeah <laughs> I remember seeing the first film and it's everybody just was the high energy and just yep. there was literally nothing like it even when I saw Spider-Man uh, No Way Home with fans it was like it was like Avengers Endgame level. I swear the first Down Nabby movie, the women in my screening, which I went with my mom and her best friend to the first one. Uh, and the women in my screening were as vocally like reactive to it as people in the screening of Endgame that I went to. Really? Like, wow. They were, when things happened that they liked, when there was a good line, they were clapping. They were like whooping. I was like, okay, we're having a party yeah. night. Like, <laughs> you feel like it's just going to be silence. <laughs> like oh, the yeah, entire time. <laughs> you would expect. I imagine yeah. that's what it's like if you actually see it in England. Like, yeah. Everyone's a like, nice mm. refined silence. <laughs> exactly. like, the way yeah. the film is meant to be viewed. Yeah. It's us noising obnoxious yeah. Americans over here, yeah, exactly. you know, just cheering after every small little line and you can't hear like <laughs> every time ne- Violet says something, everyone's like, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I, I really yeah. I, I really think that Violet definitely still shines um in yeah. this um in this All film. Hail Maggie Smith. Oh <laughs> man, um it's you know she, she's had one heck of a career and it's like yes. it's very hard to imagine her um you know without the entire crew. So it's like, you know, mm-hmm. she's always just been the heart of this um uh, this entire series and she definitely is the heart of this film. Uh, for sure. So it is, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's beautiful, you know, how they, they're still able to continue these characters stories moving forward. And I think it's, you know, it, it kind of like, you know, Oh, you, we have like the Rugrats TV show. Oh, there's a movie, but it's like, you know, the, the movies really don't push this, the story forward, obviously, but with Downton Abbey, it's, there's, it just works. And I don't know what it is. Um, I don't feel like they try to rush things because, I mean, when the first one came out, I was like, yes, you know, like this is amazing. Um, and then when they announced the second one, I was like, it felt like forever between the first two <laughs> movies. They yes. were just so silent about it. So it's it's not like, oh, you know, Kevin Feige is doing X, Y, and Z for, you know, Black <laughs> Panther 2. And, you know, it's not like Focus Feature has this roadmap for the Downton Abbey, you know, cinematic yeah. experience. Well, and like Julian <laughs> Fellows was busy doing Gilded Age too, mm-hmm. which yeah. is like... You know, I think a really great series for people who are fans of Downton Abbey, but it's totally separate. So it's I like, still have to watch that. I do too, but my parents loved it. So mm. <laughs> <laughs> I um I do think though that part of what makes particularly this movie so good is that it does feel like it is while it's taking advantage of like two very new scenarios that we've never gotten to see before on the show. Mm. It also is at its heart still very true to these characters and who they are and an evolution for them that feels very natural Mm -hmm. and very, um, you know, realistic while also still being interesting. And I think that that's the thing is that so many people fell in love with these characters back in seasons one and two, and they've done a really good job of sort of 
making them still interesting. I also cannot, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> One thing that the movies have for me over the show itself is I got so tired of feeling that I was watching the same plot line play out season after season mm. with Bates and Anna. Yep. I was like, can we decide if they're happy or not? Exactly. Like, <laughs> can they be unhappy in a new way? Right. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. And so to finally get to see like them have plot lines that are not just the same thing uh, has been so nice. Like, it has. I feel it's, like, they're just very, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're together. They're in sync. You know, they have yep. a child and, that's, you know, like that, that is their story moving forward. Like that's going to be their story for a while, you know, taking care of the child. So I, man, as yeah. soon as you said that though, I was like, oh my gosh, that's right. It was the, I oh. literally, when I rewatch the series, I will fast forward scenes. Sometimes I'm like, I can't, I can't watch her go visit him in that prison again. Like oh. I'm simply not interested. Mr. Bates. And it's, I love Anna too. Like she's one of my too. favorite characters. She is the character that I relate to. Like. I'm very honest with myself. If I was in doubt, Nabby, I would be like Anna the maid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't put on airs, but I, uh, I, I got so tired of that. So it's so nice to see, you know, really different plot lines than we're used to seeing and, and uh, different things get explored and different character dynamics. And I think that that though, they've stayed so true to what they've done with the rest of the series that Julian fellow is like, really knows what he's doing with these characters. And I loved getting to see like a little bit of a different side of Violet. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, it, it feels like this character who, who hasn't changed as much over time, maybe as a lot of the others have, she sort of, you know, is who she is and she's become a lot more accepting, I think. And, and we sort of see that, I don't think it's a spoiler say so we see that in this, that um, Branson sort of acknowledges the way that she has, really come to accept him and be a friend to him. Yeah. Even though she was initially, you know, opposed to him marrying her granddaughter. Yeah. But to get to see her in a bit of a different light and to get to see Robert sort of go through the crisis of seeing his mother in a different light was really fun. I think that Robert is a character who's been a little bit tricky in some ways. Like there are points in the series where I hate him. (laughs) I'm like, you are the worst. Like, I mean, Sybil's dead. I, Mm. <laughs> like truly i'm like all right world's worst dad award robert crawley also maybe world's worst husband award like i don't know like, i forgot about that storyline that oh that's oh right God. that's yeah. right yeah. And that, that didn't also, go anywhere though i was like how often he just openly is like yeah so when i married cora for her money and i'm like <laughs> jesus you could at least like try to say it nicer yeah. like <laughs> But I think I think we get to see him sort of uh, go through something in in this really with Mm. there's a plot line in this, which I'm like not going to say what it is because spoilers, but there's a plot line in this that I didn't expect Mm -mm. and I was not ready for it. And I cried. I feel so bad for the film security guy in my like press screening who was in there with just me. So he knew that it was me sitting there like crying time and time again, Uh, which and that's that's like. I say that, though, and it's going to sound like a spoiler for things that happen in this. It's not. Like, I also cry in happy things. Mm. <laughs> oh, like, you know, Edith, like, is finally happy and I'm yeah. just, like, sobbing. Um, Down Abbey just makes me cry. It does. Just, like, <laughs> that music starts and I'm, like, crying. It's just... Like, the, you, you know the shot that they always give with the music and you see High Clear Castle and yep. I'm, like, crying. Yeah. Um, My, like, you know, film security guy is, like, we're, like, Four minutes into the film, why is she crying? <laughs> Didn't this movie just start? <laughs> I'm like, don't mind me. Yeah, let's just have a box of tissues here in case anything emotional comes up. <laughs> I will say, like, if you're going to see this, do bring the tissues because I think mm-hmm. for Downton Abbey fans, there is a lot in it that is very emotional, much more so than the first movie. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It, it really has emotional depth that the first movie didn't have, mm-hmm. which I think is fantastic. It's it's more of, honestly, I think what I want, even though I like I really like the first movie, I think this one is a little bit more like what I wanted out of a Downton Abbey film. Yeah. The first film really sets up a lot of events mm-hmm. um, for characters and, and a new era for sure. And that's, it, it's just the beauty of it. It's like anytime, like you said, when, when I hear that theme song, it just... <laughs> I don't know. It, it it's kind of like listening to like game, like the Game of Thrones theme song. It's like it pumps me up. But like even listening to the Downton Abbey theme song, like you know, it brings up all these emotions. But like it really is like let let's go. Like let's you know let's 
<laughs> it's so um I don't know it's it's inspirational it's motivating it's it's um it's very sad at times and it's very melancholy at the same time and it's 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 everything I don't know what it is and I'm like you know the, the violin the, the piano I'm like uh it's just it's perfect harmony <laughs> it's what it really yeah. is <laughs> That's what it definitely really is. But um, I'll pass it right back over to Nicole. If there's anything you wanted to mention that we haven't brought up before we get into final thoughts on and before we close out um, with our light rate. Well, we don't even have to do ratings. We're, we're going to switch it up this time. No, no ratings okay. this time around. Okay. I'm like, <laughs> I think you know. Uh, <laughs> I will say there is a little joke in here, which first of all, I love that Amelda Staunton is back in this movie. Mm. I love this character that they set up. Um, I think it also goes to show sort of like how much we've progressed in that in like seasons one and two, there is no way that Robert would have welcomed into his home the illegitimate daughter of this woman who's married to his former chauffeur. Is it It's um, crazy. Like, I mean, he's I mean, he's forever a part of that family. Yeah. Now. And now he's like, so my son, Tom Branson. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I love that Melissa Staunton is back. I love her. And I love that there is a little joke made. There's sort of like an Easter egg of sorts about the fact that Melissa Staunton and Jim Carter are married in real life. I love that that little joke is in there. Oh, that's if, right. Yeah. There's, yep. In the shop mm-hmm. the, when the guy is like, uh, mm. you know, oh, your wife. And yeah. he's like, cool. Um, <laughs> but it's it's so cute. I actually, whenever I lived in London, I um, did press on the Olivier Award red carpet. And Imelda Stoughton was there because she was nominated. And I got to interview her in the red carpet. And Jim Carter was literally just walking behind her, holding her umbrella over her. And I was standing there like, oh, my God, it's Mr. Carson. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but so I always, getting to see them, like, have a scene together was mm. so fun. It's also quite fun. This is, like, a really weird thing. But for anyone who's listening, their daughter is one of the Featherington daughters on Bridgerton. Really? See, I need one to watch season ones. two still. I still yeah, I need think, to watch it. I could be wrong. I think it's Prudence. It could mm. be the other one. Um, but yeah, so I just am obsessed with their family. I think that they're great. That is, oh, and wow. it was really fun to see that little Easter egg. I thought that that was really cute. Okay. But, oh, and yeah. of course, you know, Mr. Mosley always, always coming around. Mr. With- <laughs> Mr. Mosley has had the biggest glow up other than Edith, like of anyone on this series. I really have loved his character development. I used just... to find him so annoying. Really? And now I'm like, oh. like in the first few seasons that we saw him, I was like, oh my God, can he not? <laughs> and now I'm like, I would give my life for Mr. Most. <laughs> but that's honestly, I feel like how I feel about every character on Downton. I'm like, mm. I would defend them. Oh, absolutely. With other, other than Robert Crawley. <laughs> um, he, I would he's, defend them. Yeah, it's, I mean, oh my gosh, Robert's been. He's, he's fine. He's come around, but it took a while. But I, I will say like sort of the, the last thing I want to say is that I love the way that they some of the relationships that they let sort of play out here, even some of them in small ways, but you know, we get to see Violet and Isabel again together. We get to see, I think the evolution of Mary and Edith's relationship is really interesting. And I think something that a lot of people actually experience where they don't get along with a sibling when they're younger and as Mm. they get older and they sort of experience things together in their family, they, they come to an understanding and I get, I love getting to see them sort of, be on the same page about things. Mm. I love getting to see Tom Branson's continued relationship with the rest of the family um, and how that sort of continues to impact all of them. And I also love that we not only get mentions of Sybil, which I think have been a lot more common throughout the series since her death, but Mm. Matthew is brought up multiple times in this film. (laughs) They finally remember that. The only thing I don't love is... I am a Henry Talbot stan. I love Matthew Good. He is an actor that I will literally watch anything to see him in. And I do really feel like because he's a little too booked and busy, uh, Henry and Mary's relationship has suffered for it. Yeah. So that did make me a little bit sad. So fellow like Henry Talbot stans, prepare yourselves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I get why they did it. And I'm happy that he's off like filming bigger things and having like a cameo in Down Abbey. But that did make me, it's the only thing in the film that I was like, oh, I yeah. wanted to see, I wanted to see Mary and Henry finally being like happy. Happy. Together. Yeah, but, I know. It's I mean, Mary's been through a lot as well. So it's <laughs> like, man, oh man. Yeah. I, I do right. agree with you there. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because I was like, oh, yeah, he's, he's not, like, here. I was like, oh, well. <laughs> not here. <laughs> like, where is Henry Talbot? No one knows. <laughs> no, nobody. Off off to the races, I guess. You yeah, know? he's off driving a car somewhere. Yeah. Which, like, historically has not been a good thing for Mary's husband. So, no. I mean, <laughs> he needs to be careful. <laughs> Maybe there's, you know, it's a little bit of foreshadowing if they ever decide to make a third movie. Which, listen, I am so here for a third movie. Like, Julian Fellows, if you're, list- if you're, if you're listening... I'm here for it. I don't know if other people feel this way. They could make 10 of these movies. They could like land before time this and I would continue to be thrilled. (laughs) Like as long as they had good stories to tell and we have thus far, I am down to continue these films. Yeah. I mean, bringing in new characters as they have with, um, with this new C, uh, not series, excuse me, film, but it, it really just, it shakes things up, you know, like the, you know, the legacy characters are there, you know, their storylines progress, but you're, you're throwing new characters in, into the mix. And, you know, especially with uh, uh, Violet's, um, re, or I guess her opinions on talkies. And, <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> she just, she's so funny. <laughs> So it's it's very funny just and great just to see how, you know, these characters react to, you know, just just the the way that the world changes. You know, we've seen it throughout the series as well, how they've had to adapt. And, you know, in order to keep, you know, the boat afloat, it really is all about just, you know, you got to march to uh, the beat to a different drum and kind of just, you know, for better or for worse. You know, it, it really yeah. is. Um, it really just is a fantastic film. I, I can't wait to see this with the uh, with, with fans. I really can't. It's it's going to be fantastic for sure. Um, but I believe that pretty much uh, closes our non spoiler review of Downton Abbey: A New Era. Again, Nicole, thank you so much for coming on. I was like, who? Oh my god, is a Downton Abbey fan out here? And I was like, I remember you ri- written a review for Next Best Picture. Um, yep. dot com. So I was like gotta have her on <laughs> i literally could talk about downton abbey every day all day long so i was so excited to get asked on to this of course it's you know it's it's like i'm like oh like this does anyone like you know like, <laughs> care like i care but <laughs> i am a focus features girl through and through you know like i everybody was like you know kind of making fun of the new like a24 like membership thing and I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's so that, you know, like, it's so funny that they're doing that, like, haha, film fans. And then I was like, yeah, focus features made one of those. I'd be the first person to sign up. So I can't, I can't talk. I definitely would uh, sign up for either something focus features. Thought maybe if Neon did something or honestly, if Marvel did, I'm, I'm there. I'm sorry. I'm there. I'm there. I'm a shell. I'm sorry. It, <laughs> it's, it's fine. I love the good. You got to take the bad with the good. And it's like, I mean, well, I guess. Marvel already has it's called Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I did like when when Disney Plus first came out, they had like a three year. It was like buy two years, get one free. Hopped right on that, like white on rice. I was like, yes, just is is there a lifetime option? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because let's be honest, I'm never I'm not getting rid of Disney Plus anytime soon. No. no. <laughs> not at all. For for all the oldies, the goodies, and all the new stuff for sure. Listen, I find new stuff on Disney Plus every day. Mm. I just recently watched, which I'm so sorry for this tangent, but I just recently watched, they have a documentary on there. Um, called Titanic 20 years later with James Cameron. Wow. It's about the it's about what James Cameron has learned since he made the film Titanic about the actual like wreck. Um, because he's been back to it 33 times. Really? Um, wow. Yeah, it is the most fascinating documentary. And like, who knew it was on Disney Plus? <laughs> like, that's not where I typically think, like, let me go watch a Titanic documentary. Yeah. But, but it it is your place for it. They have like four Titanic documentaries. Wow, <laughs> you know, and I, I think we talked about this a little bit before we started recording. Um, you know, I I was recently kicked out of the uh, suit up geeks uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> fantasy draft. I had a pretty great team, let me tell you. I had <laughs> Prisoner of Azkaban. I had Never nice. Ending Story, um, Monty Python, and the Holy Grail, Shrek oh. Two. Okay. Kubo and the Two Strings and Bridge to Terabithia, which is not streaming on Disney Plus because I wanted Truly, to see it so bad. Disney Plus, make it happen. Where is it? 
Like, it's, it's the sad, it, maybe they locked it in the Disney vault because it is literally that sad. Like it's, <laughs> it causes a lot of, you know, <laughs> they said we need society to be functioning and they will not be with this movie. <laughs> no. It's like, maybe that, that's, that's more manageable, but Brits like, we can't know? afford to be sued for emotional damages. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was actually Disney and another company that kind of worked on the uh, film together. It was it was Warner something, and I I forget I forgot the name of it because I was looking up the Blu-ray the other day uh, <laughs> to see if I can yep. snag it, uh, which I did. But thanks for the Amazon points out there, uh, Amazon. So got it for like super cheap. Uh, should be here tomorrow. So. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> grab all the tissues I can. But um wanted to pass it back over to Nicole so she can let everyone know um where they can find her on the internet and what she has coming up. Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and uh letterboxd at Nicole Ackman16. I have link trees in all those places where you can find a lot of my work. Uh Twitter is also the best place to find everything. I am, of course, over at Nice Books Picture. I also can now be found at Awards Watch, uh, doing some written reviews for them, and also on the new and improved Awards Watch podcast. Mm -hmm. I also just launched a new podcast on the Music City Drive-In Network. It is called The Barbie Breakdown, Your Guide to Greta Gerwig's Barbie. And it's me and two of my best friends, uh, Lex Williams and Jacob Thronberry. And we are basically going to spend, until the Barbie movie comes out, out preparing for it we're going through the filmographies of every actor involved the crew the creative team and we also are going to be reviewing some barbie uh cinematic universe uh animated films because i just wanted a place to talk about barbie princess and the pauper and i managed to swindle the two of them into a podcast <laughs> so it uh we have our first episode is up now please follow us on spotify and apple podcasts or you know all those places but um her Twitter is at Barbie Movie Pod. It is the most chaotic podcast I've ever taken part in. And we only have one episode thus far. So definitely come join us for the most chaotic adventure you will ever find as we uh, deep dive on Barbie. <laughs> the most passion all put into one episode. It's only going to grow from there. It's wild. The first episode, like... I don't know what happened, but suddenly we spent a lot of the episode talking about like decapitating Barbies and eating glue and like <laughs> who ate Play-Doh and who didn't as a kid. And <laughs> it went off the rails. So that can only be promising for what's to come. And that's that's <laughs> a very 90s kid way of thinking. It's like, all right, who ate the Play-Doh when they were younger? You know, yep. who chopped off the Barbie's yep. heads. You know, yeah. if, if you had a sister, you know, did you torture her? Yes or no with all that? Yeah, it's I will say there was only one person who had done both of those things. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't me. Oh, OK. Oh, the plot. I've thickens. never decapitated a Barbie. I'm going to defend myself right here. <laughs> like, <laughs> Do I look like someone who would decapitate a Barbie? <laughs> no, like, yeah, there's nothing about me that would suggest that I have ever decapitated anything. I was not a big uh, Barbie doll fan when I was younger. So, yeah. <laughs> Never like no, mm -mm, nope. Yeah, no. But but weren't like attacking other people. It was just like. it was weird. Like I had this really weird like like hair thing with Barbies, and like my sister would like torture me, like putting them in my bed, like when I was sleeping, and I'm like, <gasps> it was so not funny. fun. <laughs> It was not fun at all. I love that. She was like a torture method is just to make my Barbie be around you. Yeah. Like. I'm like brats, Barbies. All, no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. not. That's fair. <laughs> <clears throat> but hey, you know, you, you live and you learn. But yeah. uh, you can find all of Nicole's links in the episode notes of this description underneath helpful links there. So what's coming up for us on our podcast, you may ask, uh, we recently actually just did a non-spoiler review of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, um, as well as capping off the Moon Knight series or season finale, excuse me, episode six. And coming up, I believe we're going to be doing like some Top Gun, uh, A24's Men as well, um, some Obi-Wan uh, goodness there some stranger things is coming up so definitely keep a lookout for that um we just had to take a little bit of a break here on the podcast um so um we just we're kind of just figuring out what to what to do next it was just you know had a few um family emergencies here and there for sure 
uh, between me and my co-host. But we will be back at our, I guess you could say our normal schedule sometime soon. It's always weird, like we're transitioning. You know, you're, you're finishing up like a TV series, like week to week. And then it's like, oh, fire starters out. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm fine. So I, I think it's just one of those dry spell weeks uh, for sure. Of course, you know, by the time this is out, I believe uh, Downton Abbey, a new era hits theaters May 20th, I believe. Sounds right. Sounds right. Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> I, I was like, what day of the week is that? That's I don't know. Correct. Other than, I will say there's like a weird caveat that a lot of theaters are doing a special early screening, I think on May 18th. Mm. Um, but it officially hits theaters on May 20th. Right. And so does uh, A24's Men, I believe, as well. So that's always. I need to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm ready to see that yeah. one. Jesse Buckley, yeah. 100%. Yes. <laughs> Give me all the British actors. It's it's fine. Yes. I, I honestly think they are like the best actors like working today, to be completely honest. It's it's mind blowing for sure. Don't yeah. worry, darling. We'll be there for you soon. I'm ready. <laughs> for sure. So those are just a few things coming up on our show. And uh before we close out, we just wanted to ask everyone out there um if there's one thing you take away from our episode, if you've made it this far, is to share an episode with a friend. Uh, whether it be your mother, your brother, your lover, whoever it may be, make sure to share an episode of the Film Optics Podcast with a movie lover in need. So that pretty much wraps up today. And we hope you guys have a great start to your week. And we'll see you guys later on. And that's a wrap for today. Thank you all for listening. And if you enjoy the show, leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram to stay in the know. That was Nicole. My name is Christian. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.